sorry sir uh, yeah yeah share screen is there yeah yeah i'll do that Good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to the webinar on overview of dialysis and renal transplantation organized by International Society for Renal Research, ISRR, and supporting partner BioLeads. On the behalf of International Society for Renal Research, I would extend a warm welcome to our esteemed speakers and the participants who have joined the forum. I can assure you that this session would be highly informative to all the participants. International Society for Renal Research. As a professional organization, the International Society for Renal Research, ISRR, was established in the year 2015 to address the dire needs of medical professionals working in the fields of nephrology and diabetes by fostering R&D in our nation and serving the public. As a resolution adopted by the board during our inaugural meeting held in Chennai, India, in 2015 brought about the establishment of the organization on the initiative of a small group of professionals, professors, scientists from South India. The primary goal of ISRR are the professional advancement of doctors, medical professionals, and young researchers, as well as the general advancement of the organization for nephrology and diabetes research. Integrity, continuous learning, innovation, leadership, and commitment to the medical professionals are the guiding concept of ISRR that deals that uh, will ensure better development in the future. BioLeaks is a non-profit professional association which prominently, which prominently promotes research and development. We at BioLeaks have brought a revolution in the field of conferences worldwide. BioLeaks conferences bring together the professional wizards and leaders who have explored all the avenues to reinforce the field of life science and medicine technology. BioLeaks conduct events worldwide, which help in enhancing the skill set of people from diverse industries and forms a common platform for eminent personalities, physicians, researchers, doctors, professional business figures, and much more. BioLeaks conferences encourage better comprehension about improvement and progression over the world through worldwide conferences with the speed of science and technology. We work with our motto of creating a better tomorrow by organizing conferences and creating a network which will, which will help grow a better tomorrow with the help of advanced technology and achieve. Nephrology is a branch of medicine that focuses on the diagnosis and the treatment of kidney disease. It is an area of expertise for physicians and other healthcare professionals who specialize in managing and treating kidney disorders, including chronic kidney disease, acute renal failure, dialysis, and kidney transplantation. Nephrologists typically provide medical care for patients with kidney disorders, as well as counsel and educate parents, uh, educate patients and their families about their condition. They also work closely with other healthcare professionals to provide a comprehensive approach to the care of patients with kidney disorders. Now moving on to our lecture, it's given me an immense pleasure to introduce the speaker for today. The first speaker for the today is Dr. Dr. Navinant Mohan, consultant nephrologist and renal transplant physician, AINU Chennai. He is a consultant in the Department of Nephrology. Dr. Navinath Mohan is a young and dynamic nephrologist and renal transplant physician with five years of experience after completion of nephrology fellowship. An alumnus of prestigious Ames Delhi Hospital, he specializes in managing renal transplants and dialysis patients. 
He has a special interest in ABO, incompatible renal transplant, peritoneal dialysis, and hemodialysis. He is also trained to perform renal biopsies and manage patients with any nephrology-related problems. Sir will be discussing about dialysis in kidney disease patients, all you need to know. Then moving on to our next presenter, we have Dr. Gauri Sh Shankar Jagadish, consultant nephrologist, Royal London Hospital, United Kingdoms. Dr. Gauri Shankar is currently working as a locum renal consultant at Royal London Hospital, managing patients in the acute transplant clinics, transplant patients in the renal wards and inpatient refers from Royal London Hospital and its affiliated hospitals. Involved in the teaching of junior doctors and he is responsible for living donor and pre-transplant assessment of medically complicated patients. Sir will be discussing about renal plant transplant FAQs. On the behalf of International Society for Renal Research, I would like to take this moment to express our heartfelt gratitude to our expert speakers, Dr. Navinanth Mohan and Dr. Gauri Shankar Jagadish for taking the time to share your vast knowledge in this vital topic, despite of a busy schedule. I kindly request Dr. Navinanth Mohan to take over the session. Uh, okay. Please note, if you have any questions or doubt, we welcome you to leave those queries in the chat box. Okay. Uh, thank you, madam, for that uh, elaborate uh, introduction. So uh, I would like to welcome all the uh, participants to this uh, kind of a packed session. So what we'll be doing uh, right now is uh, to see about the basics of dialysis. So I think I'll be taking around 30 minutes. I hope I am audible to everyone. Is it okay? Fine. Uh, yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah. So let us start off uh, quickly. So the screen is all visible. You can see the slides. Uh, yes, sir. It is visible. Yeah. So, uh, so what I've planned today is uh, to discuss something about the basics of dialysis. Okay. So whenever I start any uh, talk anywhere, I usually start by uh, thanking my alma mater. So which happens to be Madurai Medical College and Raman Rajaji Hospital in Madurai, where I did my UG and the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, uh, New Delhi, where I did my uh, postgraduate training and my fellowship training. So it's been, uh, as they said, uh, more than six, seven years since I finished, but still what I am today is because of uh, these two great institutions. And I always start by thanking the teachers, the patients and my friends from these two great institutions. Uh, this is my current affiliation. I work at this place. I'm based out of Chennai. So this is a renal specialty hospital based out of uh, Nungambakam in Chennai. Uh, so we have various other branches throughout India. Okay. So let's start off. So before I start off with uh, dialysis per se, you need to have some break uh, background knowledge about chronic kidney disease. So a, a short introduction about chronic kidney disease. So I'm sure all of you know when I say chronic kidney disease, the thing which comes to your mind is an elevated creatinine. Okay, so it's not only creatinine, okay, we need to understand that whenever we talk about chronic kidney disease, there are two things to this uh, definition. One is a duration and second one is regarding the uh, parameters. Okay, so one such parameter is the creatinine, which helps us to measure what is called as the EGFR. Okay, so that's what is given over here. So when a patient has a GFR less than 60 or is having persistent proteinuria, or any structural damage. Okay, so let us say, for example, uh, polycystic kidney disease. So these people can have a normal creatinine and no proteinuria, but still they would be classified of, as chronic kidney disease based on the criteria of structural abnormality. And these abnormalities, that is an elevated creatinine or an elevated proteinuria, that is an albumin creatinine ratio, that's what is mentioned by ACR, greater than 30 milligram per gram should be there for at least three months. Only then you can call a patient to be having a chronic kidney disease. So this staging, again, it is one of the uh, most often quoted uh, table. I'm sure you would have been uh, reading about this from your right from your MBBS days. So this classification of CKD into stages is predominantly based on uh, the GFR. Okay, so the GFR can be calculated from the uh, creatinine values and based on the GFR, they can be classified between stage one to stage five. Okay, so the, no the natural question which usually comes to people is that just now we said that the GFR less than 60 only will qualify as chronic kidney disease then what does stage one and two mean? So this stage is predominantly for the other two categories. That is for people with persistent proteinuria. If they have normal creatinine, they may fall in this category of stage one or two. 
so purely based on creatinine alone or if you are going to classify patient as ckd based on uh, renal function that is gfr alone usually their stage would be some somewhere above 3 okay and 3 has been further uh, uh, divided into a and b that is uh, ckd stage 3a being uh, a gfr between 30 and 45 and 3b being between 45 and 60 so if the patient is a renal transplant recipient you add a t behind the number okay so that's what t stands for and if you add the uh, alphabet d after uh, ckd5 it becomes an end stage renal disease and this means the patient is on maintenance hemodialysis so coming to uh, chronic kidney disease in india so is it really a big problem so actually we were not having really very good data until recently okay so this was a government sponsored uh, program which was conducted at least in the state of tamil nadu where they found that up to even uh, one every 10 people might be having some form of chronic kidney disease now that's an alarming number so up to 10% of our population seem to be having something to do with uh, a kidney problem so that's how common the problem is being and the commonest cause as most of you all might know is actually diabetes and unfortunately in our country most of the patient present to us at a very late stage so even finding the cause becomes very difficult so that's why this undetermined portion is still quite high in our country the other common cause is actually hypertension and some of them can be due to glomerulonephritis and uh, chronic interstitial nephritis is coming up in a big way in the recent uh, past few years and many times it's been associated with uh, environmental uh, issues and all those things if you go to end stage renal disease that is people needing dialysis per se that is somewhere between around 3 lakh every year so that is also a very big number so around the world if you see again uh, the mortality seems to be lowest in europe and japan predominantly because they have really very good uh, dialysis facilities over there the five year survival in the us for patients on hd is actually dismal if you see many patients with cancer even don't have such poor survival so that's how bad a disease end stage renal disease can be and the commonest cause for death remains to be uh, cardiovascular disease so most of the patients with a chronic kidney disease would die of a heart disease rather than progress to end stage renal disease so this is a very very important point so if at all you are caring for any patient with chronic kidney disease never forget to look at their heart as well because that would be the common cause for their uh, demise so this is another very very important point so when do you start uh, renal replacement therapy that is a dialysis or when do you start thinking about transplant for patients with chronic kidney disease so if you see the list actually i've given creatinine nowhere so basically you don't start dialysis just based on the creatinine value or the gfr value so you think about these things only when the gfr is low or the creatinine is high but that is not the only criteria together with such a, a, a poorly functioning kidney you should have other parameters like hyperkalemia or a metabolic acidosis or refractory fluid overload which is not being managed by uh, diuretics or certain other features like uh, uremic pericarditis and such certain uremic features so the clinical features are what really tells you whether to start dialysis or not so you can remember it in an easier manner this okay with this uh, i think there is aiou that is metabolic acidosis uh, electrolytes especially hyperkalemia uh, this is again basically for a patient with acute kidney injury so if, if the patient has taken any uh, alcohol or some drug in, uh, intoxications for patients with refractory fluid overload and in patients who are uremic so remember this together with a very low gfr so creatinine alone or a low gfr alone is never an indication to start dialysis so what are the treatment options for an end stage renal disease patient so many times what happens is that as nephrologists many times in our practice what we see is that the patient come to us at a very very late stage so they come to us at a stage where we are almost having to start them on dialysis immediately now that's not a really ideal situation so at an earlier stage of ckd if the patient comes to us we can start them on uh, uh, we can start counseling them regarding the various treatment options which are available we can prepare them for dialysis and maybe even start uh, counseling them for renal transplant and all those things we can get them vaccinated and plan for uh, dialysis access now I'll, i'll be explaining about the importance of dialysis access very shortly and why it needs to be done before rather than wait till the patient goes into end stage renal disease the last line is what i want you all to concentrate on there is there is no study which shows that there is benefit of initiating dialysis preemptively that is starting dialysis early rather than once the patient develops uremic symptoms is really not of great help so in, a, in any patient with end stage renal disease these are the three major renal replacement therapy options which you have which is hemodialysis peritoneal dialysis and kidney transplant so you can mix and match okay so a patient who is on hemodialysis can be initially start on hemodialysis then go for transplant or directly go for transplant or go to pd you can have mix and match 
also remember there's one other important area which is some patients might not be really candidates for renal replacement therapy or may not be really willing to start uh, either a dialysis or transplant so even comfort care is the modality of treatment in patients with end stage renal disease though it might not be the best option it's something similar to a palliative care for a patient with end stage uh, cancer so in short uh, what are all the various uh, dialysis modalities you have that is hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis okay so peritoneal dialysis is uh, it's less efficient than hemodialysis but when done daily it can be similar to a twice or thrice weekly uh, maintenance hemodialysis and hemodialysis can be either in center or home hd in our country we predominantly follow the in center hemodialysis where the patient has to come to the hospital or a clinic having dialysis facilities peritoneal dialysis is again something which can be done by the patient in their own home so for people who are far away from a dialysis facility or who really have a very busy lifestyle having lots of traveling to do for them pd might be a better option and pd can also be done either manually or using a using a cycler which is called as automated pd or a uh, cyclical pd a few words about uh, hemodialysis so history okay so history is very very important so how we have reached the present stage in hemodialysis so it was not a easy path so most of the work started in the uh, early 20th century around 1913 so you can see, see the initial uh, uh, dialyzer and the dialysis uh, machine was almost equal to the size of the bed i'm sure nowadays you have all of you have seen how a dialysis happens the filter size and all has become really small you can carry it in your hand but initially when it started it was such a big machine and running this was not easy okay so these are all the stalwarts who have done lots of work in developing the science behind hemodialysis and this gentleman okay so he is a german uh, willem kolf he is uh, regarded as the father of hemodialysis and what are the principles behind uh, uh, hemodialysis so it's not rocket science it's very very simple principles which we have been studying right from our school days uh, in fact uh, since our 6 7 standard days which is uh, diffusion that is solutes will move from a, a area of higher concentration towards an area of lower concentration or uh, Uh, then ultra filtration that is a pressure difference between two compartments can drive fluid from the area where a higher pressure is applied to the area where the pressure is lower and when the solute gets dragged together with this pressure it is referred to as convection so basically dialysis uses these uh, uh, principles of uh, physics that is diffusion convection and ultra filtration okay so this is a dialyzer i'm sure all of you all have seen a dialyzer this this, this can be uh, held in the hand so uh, this is a cross section of a dialyzer you can see all these minute small small uh, fibers so this is a cross section so you have blood inside these uh, fibers the patient's blood is run through these fibers and bathing the fibers on either side is something you call as the dialysate which is the fluid which is prepared by the uh, dialysis uh, machine okay so this is how a, a schematic picture looks like so the patient's blood is run on one side on the other side in the opposite direction or in the uh, same direction so if it's in the opposite direction we call it as counter current if it's in the same direction we call it as co current flow okay the dialysate and the uh, blood are run in opposite directions so that the concentration difference as you might expect the urea and the various uh, uremic toxins are supposed to be at a higher concentration in the patient's blood side than in the dialysate side so there would be a shift in these solutes from the blood into the dialysate and certain uh, uh, things which the patient needs can be shifted from the dialysate into the blood so that's what happens so i've mentioned a few words about reprocessing of dialyzer so uh, the ideally speaking this dialyzer should be reused only once reuse is not something which is really recommended so even now in our country we are moving towards single use uh, dialysis method so in our center we don't have any reuse uh, facility we don't reuse our dialyzer uh, in some uh, resource uh, limited setting they do reuse the dialyzer but i'm sure within in the near future within a few years even most of the centers in our country would not be uh, reusing the dialyzer so the dialysate so i told you the blood is run against another fluid which is called the dialysate which is prepared by the dialysis machine uh, the one point i want you to concentrate over here is the last line okay so the dialysate actually how much electrolyte it contains and all those things are tightly regulated we really need not go into the uh, depths of that but the last point is very important this might be somewhat mind boggling for you so each hd patient is exposed to around 120 liters of water per session so imagine the amount of water we need to run a dialysis facility okay so this is a very very important point and to get this amount of pure water see this is a very 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 pure form of water it's not the normal water or the municipal water which we drink okay so this needs to be derived from something called as 
reverse osmosis so in our unit we have a double ro system so even more purity so this for this you need to have set up a, a, a elaborative procedure to uh, develop a very very pure form of water so almost this 120 liters of water comes from somewhere around 800 to 1000 liters of water so one person per uh, per session needs this much quantity of water for a single session of dialysis so you can imagine how much of water is really needed to run a dialysis facility so for hemodialysis so the bane of uh, hemodialysis or the achilles heel of hemodialysis as we say is the vascular access so if you don't have an access to draw blood from the patient hemodialysis just is not going to work okay so uh, that's why you need to have and plan for uh, hemodialysis access well before you can start the patient on hemodialysis the access which we all prefer is referred to as av fistula so this is something called as a permanent uh, access so this is done by a minor surgery in usually the uh, non dominant uh, arm of the patient usually we try to do it in the distal uh, forearm that is referred to as the radio cephalic fistula and it takes uh, this fistula somewhere around 6 weeks to 12 weeks for it to mature so even if we make a fistula today we will not be able to use it for the next 6 to 12 weeks so that's why much before we start the patient on dialysis we like to uh, make a av fistula for them and keep and when they develop uh, uremic fistulas we start them on dialysis to av fistula this is something which is always preferred so that's why we say that it's always better to refer a patient with uh, later stages of ckd to a nephrologist rather than wait for him to uh, enter into a stage of end stage renal failure uh, so a uh, uh, few words about av graft so this is for a certain uh, group of patients where av fistula is not possible this is also kind of a permanent access but still this involves placing a synthetic material between the artery and the vein okay here the vein is not connected to the artery you keep a foreign metal which is a ptfe graft usually between the vein and the artery the other commonly used kind of access would be the temporary catheter so this is for patients who come to us uh, in the last moment when uh, we we are not able to make a fistula or make a fistula and do the uh, dialysis through the fistula immediately for them uh, we we uh, put a temporary catheter i'm sure most of you all would have seen usually in the ijv or the femoral veins uh, preferably not in the subclavian veins okay here also you can have two types of uh, temporary catheters called as either tunneled catheters or non tunneled catheters tunneled catheters are otherwise called as perm cats as many of you all might know it has a cuff and it's it it offers slightly better protection than a non tunneled catheter okay but uh, tunnel catheters are much much costlier the biggest problem with temporary catheters as you might have uh, guessed is infection okay so that's why we would like to avoid temporary catheters as much as possible but unfortunately in our practice most of the time we end up having to use temporary catheters to start a patient on dialysis which is really not at all ideal uh coming to the vascular access guidelines so if at all there are any interns or junior doctors who are listening to this remember whenever you are dealing with a patient with uh, later stages of ckd try to preserve their upper limb veins okay because these veins are absolutely necessary for forming making a fistula for them so if you are going to do repeated vein punctures from these sites and these veins get damaged we won't be able to make a good fistula for them in future and that can result in lots of problems for the patient so always try to draw blood from the distal veins that is the dorsum or something like that that would be really suitable and if the patient has already made an av fistula never use that uh, hand for uh, drawing blood or to measure your blood pressure or things like that and it's always better to avoid the subclavian vein for uh, access for a dialysis patient because chance of stenosis are very very high so goals of hemodialysis i had some four five slides over here but i've cut short into one for the simple reason that It, more than the uh, uh, lab report based uh, outcomes it is the patient based outcomes it's really very very important so nowadays we are all transitioning to something called as quality of life uh, based outcomes so the, if the patient is feeling better or not and if the patient if the patient was previously volume overload has its volume overload symptoms improved uremic feature symptoms improving so these are all given more importance rather than urea reduction ratio or a kt by v alone but if you want a number then yeah you have to measure kt by v and you try to keep it at a level more than 1.1 now what is kt by v you are i think it's all beyond the scope of our discussion if you are really interested we can discuss the, that in the question answer session so this is an important thing so i told you that starting dialysis early that is before the patient develops the uremic symptoms just because the creatinine is high or the gfr is low does not really uh, translate into better outcomes that is mortality benefit so that's what this graph really shows so again hd is really not a very simple treatment it, it is uh, loaded with multiple complications which the patient can develop the most common of them being hypotension for obvious reasons because you are removing a large volume of blood 
so uh, so we remove nearly 200 to 300 ml of blood per minute okay so especially the cardiac patients they are very very susceptible to develop hypotension so if this happens you should be equipped to manage that apart from this you can have various other issues like cramps anaphylactic reactions dialyzer reactions uh, uh, allergic reactions and uh, air embolism multiple issues okay so that that's why it needs close monitoring and it's always better to do dialysis in a center where there is round the clock physician presence or a nephrologist presence uh, obviously uh, so a few words about peritoneal dialysis so uh, so peritoneal dialysis is something where you use the peritoneal membrane as a natural filter rather than trying to use a artificial filter which is used in uh, hemodialysis the peritoneal membrane itself can be used as a filter here as you as the picture shows you can uh, uh, let in fluid that is the dialysate inside the peritoneal cavity via a pd catheter and after some dwell time we call it around 3 uh, to 4 hours uh, which your uh, nephrologist might prescribe you let out the spent fluid out through this uh, flu, uh, through the pd catheter again okay so this works on the principle that the peritoneal membrane itself can act as a, a semi permeable membrane similar to the dialyzer in the hemodialysis okay there there is something called as a three pore model that is the various pores in the peritoneal membrane there are of various sizes like the uh, ultra small one the small one or the large one and based on that the solute uh, diffusion uh, we have seen the principle the principle remains the same diffusion and all those things can happen obviously ultra filtration cannot happen over here you don't apply any pressure on either side so that's why ultra filtration can be a bit uh, tricky in patients with uh, peritoneal dialysis so how you exchange the peritoneal fluid based on that uh, you can have uh, various normal filter like the continuous pd where some amount of uh, pd fluid remains in the patient's peritoneal cavity all the time that is this is uh, three exchanges done in the day and one night time uh, exchange so how long you keep in the night or how frequently you have to make exchanges is something which the nephrologist decide based on the peritoneal characteristics and the clinical features of the patient okay Uh, yeah and you can also do uh, intermittent pd that is night only pd or uh, here what we do is only during the night times we do multiple exchanges and in the day time the patient is free to do his work so this can be achieved by using cyclers okay this is also uh, referred to as automated peritoneal dialysis so usually peritoneal dialysis fluid comes in 1.5 to 3 liter bags okay so you we usually use 2 liter bags and these are all hypertonic so the uh, diffusion over here happens because of the tonicity difference between the fluid in the peritoneal cavity and in the patient's blood that is the peritoneal capillaries okay this hypertonicity is achieved using glucose okay so that's why uh, patients who are on peritoneal dialysis can have lots of uh, uh, problems with their glucose control because you are giving them glucose in fact and uh, nowadays we have various uh, different forms of uh, uh, solutes like the icodextrin fluid which is basically used to improve uh, ultra filtration volumes so just like the catheter i told you for uh, hemodialysis we have a peritoneal dialysis catheter okay so this is an absolutely important thing for access to the peritoneal cavity these are the various things which we can use the commonly used ones are either the swan neck catheter or the two cup straight catheter but it depends on the surgeon's uh, uh, expertise or the uh, whatever the nephrologist prefers nowadays most of these procedures are done laparoscopically which is much more safe and uh, the outcomes are much better because we can anchor the tip of the uh, pd catheter to the uh, uh, pelvic wall so that uh, chance of migrations of the migration of the pd tip or uh, uh, omental wrap and all these things are really low again the major issue with peritoneal dialysis is uh, infection okay you can also have various non infective complications as shown over here but many many times the patients don't accept peritoneal dialysis for this uh, infection risk because unfortunately the patient has to do the peritoneal dialysis by himself and uh, many times if they are not going to maintain proper uh, asepsis it can result in peritonitis and that can lead on to problems okay so if the patient develops peritoneal dialysis i mean pd peritonitis how do you find out basically you will have a cloudy uh, dialysate that is whatever fluid which comes out uh, can be very cloudy and based on that uh, uh, you will have to make a diagnosis that is you send it for cytology see the number of uh, cells which is there and send it for culture and based on the uh, organism you grow you can start the patient on uh, antibiotics okay so this just uh, shows a, a flow chart and this is how uh, a pd uh, uh, infection looks like that is you can see this uh, significant infection with the cuff extruding and showing out and all those things so very important slide uh, so i want to discuss about where you cannot do dialysis actually 
there are very few absolute contraindications per se to peritoneal dialysis yes obviously if your abdominal cavity is not ideal you won't be able to do a peritoneal dialysis especially in patients having stoma or having a, a diaphragmatic fluid leak and if the patient has undergone a recent surgery it might not be easy for hemodialysis as i said the main problem is access if you don't have access that is let's say all your uh, uh, jugular veins or the major central veins are all thrombosed or stenosed uh, due to any reason you won't be able to do a hemodialysis and certain relative contraindications are given there so this is a very very important thing so uh, so let us say you have a very very elderly gentleman so more than 80 years of age uh, almost bed bound uh, uh, and uh, and having in stage renal disease the decision to start these patients on uh, uh, renal replacement therapy especially dialysis and all is, it becomes really difficult so this becomes a, a shared decision making you will have to discuss with the family members and uh, the patient also if they are able to decide for themselves whether there is any point in really uh, starting them on dialysis because see dialysis does not is not a cure it, it is just a bridge uh, actually we have our next speaker we going to be talking on transplant so treatment for end stage renal disease at the end of the day is actually transplant so dialysis is just buying you some time and unfortunately if the patient has no donor then there's nothing much you can do and you'll have to just continue the patient on good quality dialysis now which we are having uh, but whether it is really worthwhile for the uh, for a patient who's uh, bed bound and really very elderly to be uh, put on dialysis uh, so this is somewhat a gray area and needs discussion with the family members and for such patients what we can do is put them on medical management okay maybe give them a good shot of uh, diuretics and uh, certain other uh, treatment to take care of their electrolytes and all those things is what we can try so long term outcomes again i told you uh, the most important thing is cardiovascular health okay and there is also some role for uh, statins okay there were a few studies which showed them to be of use one other important point which many of us forget is protein energy malnutrition many times patients who are on uh, hemodialysis uh, uh, they they become very very malnourished especially if they don't get adequate dialysis so dialysis we usually recommend at least three sessions per week of uh, four hours each session and for patients who are having very good urine output then we can consider maybe twice a week but ideally for everyone they should be on thrice a week uh, hemodialysis uh, and based on the various adequacy parameters i discussed you can de decide on whether increasing the frequency of dialysis or decreasing the frequency of dialysis usually decreasing the frequency of dialysis is something which we are usually not able to but most of the time we might have to increase the frequency of dialysis especially if the patient becomes anuric so just a word before i finish i mean mostly i just want to just talk about uh, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis because i'm talking about dialysis just for completion i'm going to talk about uh, continuous renal replacement uh, this has no role in treating patients with chronic kidney disease this is predominantly for patients with acute kidney injury so in patients with acute kidney injury what can happen is that you can have a very very low bp especially very very sick patients uh, during the covid pandemic we had many patients in the icu who were very sick on multiple inotropic support for such patients doing hemodialysis is it's next to impossible i told you that one of the major issues with hemodialysis is a drop in bp so for such patients we do something called as a crrt where uh, we we can remove smaller amounts of uh, blood at a very very low speed and decrease the dialysate flow to a, a very low level and hence do dialysis so this is essentially done 24 hours a day so this is done continuously unlike hemodialysis intermittent hemodialysis is done for around 4 hours a day so this is predominantly for very very sick patients here uh, we use convection modality of uh, removal predominantly okay and uh, these are the circuits where you, uh, various uh, names which they give a uh, hemo filtration and hemo diafiltration and so on and so forth you really need not go into the depths of this but understand crrt is predominantly done for patients who are having acute kidney injury and it is done throughout the day the other big problem with crrt is that you need separate machine for that you cannot do crrt with your normal hemodialysis machine so let us say you are in your center you have hemodialysis machine you don't have a crrt machine uh, is there any way in which you can manage patients with uh, acute kidney injury and uh, borderline low bp let's not say a very low bp can they be managed with the normal hemodialysis machine yeah for that we use something called a sled which is called a sustained low efficiency dialysis here we prolong the duration of dialysis instead of the 4 hours which we do in intermittent hemodialysis we do this dialysis for around 8 to 16 hours also and we decrease the uh, blood flow to the minimum possible which is somewhere around 200 mls per minute and decrease the dialysate flow to the minimum which is somewhere around uh, 200 to 300 mls per minute and uh, try to manage but if the patient is uh, bp is falling even with sled then you don't have much of a go you'll have to go for crrt or consider acute peritoneal dialysis 
so what are the future directions so uh, there are a lot many things are going on in the dialysis world like uh, uh, body dialysis and all those things i have not really discussed over here uh, but i think that will take much more time and that is predominantly only for patients with acute kidney injury but for ckd i think these things uh, might come in the near future but i don't see them coming within the next 3 uh, 4 years at least but hopefully we, we reach a stage where we are able to bring them into clinical practice you might have seen these uh, pictures in the uh, uh, newspaper ads as well this is the artificial wearable kidney where everything is miniaturized okay so we live in a, uh, in a, in a era where nanotechnology and all those things are being discussed in a big way so we are trying to miniaturize the filter and the uh, development of uh, dialysate using uh, adsorbents and all those technologies okay so maybe in the near future you will be able to wear the entire hemodialysis machine and the filter and all those things in a vest around you and just continue with your uh, daily activity just like a glucose pump and things like that so this is hopefully not uh, far off into the future and we are also trying to uh, learn about uh, zeno transplantation all those things uh, maybe my next speaker will talk about that so the biggest problem with transplant is actually the availability of donor okay we have, the number of people needing transplant far uh, it's much more than the number of people who we have to donate or the number of organs we have available so we are really doing research into whether we'll be able to use uh, animal kidneys uh, that is called as zeno transplantation so work is going on in that area and also in uh, art uh, implantable artificial kidney but they are all in very early stages of development have not yet been uh, adopted into uh, clinical uh, practice uh, there there have been a few studies on uh, uh, animal kidney transplant that is zeno transplantation which was published very recently i mean a year or two back but still they are not there in clinical practice it may take some more time before we reach that level yeah i think i've come to the end with that so uh, hopefully you learned something from that okay so if you have any uh, doubts uh, regarding this Uh, you can uh, anytime mail me so that's i have two mail ids it's given over there either is navinapro@gmail.com or navinames@gmail.com thank you you, you have any questions okay i'll hand it back to the organizers Thank you, sir, for the informative session. Now, I kindly request Dr. Gauri Shankar Jagadish to take over the session. Just give me a moment. I'm trying to share my screen. just going to quit and rejoin it just needs me to quit and rejoin to share my slides if that's okay yeah okay sure sir
Hi, sorry for the delay. I just think uh, there was some technical issue and I think I've sorted that out. Yeah. Uh, are you able to see my screen now? Uh, yes, it is visible now. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, giving me the opportunity to present and uh, I thank the previous speaker for giving a, an excellent talk and a brief outline on uh, um, dialysis and I think that made the things easier for me as well and uh, I'm I uh, I'm going to just talk about basics of uh, renal transplant. I'm not going to talk about risk assessment. Uh, I'm more importantly going to talk about induction and uh, maintenance Im immunosuppression. And uh, I would not be talking about the trials as well. So as uh, the previous speaker told us, life on dialysis is very difficult. O only if we are a patient, we would know uh, coming to the hospital three times a week and then uh, undergoing dialysis for four hours every session is like a punishment but uh, uh, people with CKD have no other options except for going through that and uh, the the answer to dialysis would be uh, transplant. Transplant has repeatedly shown that it not only improves the morbidity and mortality of uh, people on uh, people with CKD, but it also has shown that uh, um, it improves the quality of life significantly. Uh, we may not understand uh, many things like people having uh, a lot of patients who undergo transplant would say that the first time in their uh, after being diagnosed to have kidney disease they are able to eat properly uh, that's one major difference a transplant can produce and uh, uh, briefly to do a transplant you need a donor kidney i will briefly tell you about where all we can get a donor kidney and uh, once we have a kidney we can try we do transplant it into the recipient that's the patient who's got kidney disease and uh, as shown in this picture we would usually transplant it to the iliac fossa and uh, anastomose it to the iliac vessels so how many transplants can a patient get a patient can have multiple transplants it's usually one kidney that's taken from either a living donor or a deceased donor and be transplanted to the iliac fossa in the setting of a deceased donor that is when we get kidneys from people who have uh, uh, brain dead or on um, cardiac death we can get the kidney like we can get two kidneys if the function of the kidney is suboptimal so uh, so most often we do a single kidney and that's transplanted to the uh, iliac fossa and if you ask me what's the lifespan of a kidney transplant the average lifespan of the kidney transplant would vary anywhere between 8 to 15 years and that's dependent on um, if you look at the data from US, UK and other countries, it would vary significantly. But on an average, you can say that a transplanted kidney would last for 8 to 15 years. And uh, after tra transplant, if the kidney fails, they also have the option to go ahead with a second transplant or a third transplant. So coming on to first, we would talk briefly about donors. So it can, we can get kidneys as i told you a living donor can uh, donate the kidney that is friends or family members of the recipient can come forward and say that they are fit to uh, they want to donate so the important things that we see in a don donor who has come forward is first thing is ethically they should not be forced they should come there voluntarily and they should be related to the patient and uh, uh, they should be free of uh, diseases like cancers or uh, even diabetes and stuff which would put the donors at risk for kidney disease are relative contraindications so we need to consider those things before donation so one thing as uh, all of you need to know is about what's the risk of if because this you could encounter in your day-to-day -day life one of your friends or family members could come forward to you and ask can i donate my kidneys is it uh, is it a problem if i donate 
So this is a study which has done in like you have see, you could see that there are around 96,000 donors and 96,000 controls and they followed it up for 15 years and they found that the relative risk, long-term risks of kidney donation is uh, long-term risk of developing end-stage kidney disease is slightly higher with uh, uh, living uh, with donors, but then the risk is not significant, so much significant if you see the risk is just 0.1%. That is, if 1,000 people donate, 10 people would develop kidney disease at the end of 15 years. So that's a very minimal number, and most often people would be motivated to donate despite this, okay? So coming on to, as I told you, living donation is a safe process and with uh, newer surgical techniques and uh, uh, medical care, we are able to care for living donors in a good way and they have a relatively good span. If you compare it to the general population itself, living donors would have a much better life out health outcome because they tend to be, they are like, distilled from the general population without diabetes and other other problems and another question is would patients with hyper can patients with uh, hypertension donate their kidneys yes they can if they are well controlled so that's something that we need to know as well and uh, the apart from the living donor setting the other setting where we can get a donor is from the disease donation that is brain dead or circulatory death. So uh, this is more common in European countries and uh, in US where there is a streamlined system to retrieve organs and also consenting. In India, it's an opt-in process. That's kind of a problem but because the patient should have opted in for the donation or the family member should say that uh, should they should accept for donation, which has a lot of cultural and ethical issues surrounding it. Whereas in the UK, especially where I'm working, it's an opt-out procedure that is all people while they get registered for medical uh, into the uh, once they come into the country or once they are born or once they reach adulthood they would be uh, made uh, opt-in opted for a uh, organ donation only people uh, who have concerns or who are not willing they would opt out of the procedure and they need to sign a form for it so that's kind of the difference between what we see here versus what we see in India. And uh, as the previous speaker told, the need for organs is quite high and uh, uh, the, the government needs to do something to improve the availability of organs uh, to our kidney disease patients. So in the disease donor, we've got uh, people who have brain death and who have circulatory death. So generally speaking, living donors have very good outcome, followed by people who are brain dead and then who circle DCD, we call these as disease brain dead donors and this is circulatory uh, donation after cardiac death. And this is donation after brain dead. Generally, DBD donors tend to do better than DCD donors. And uh, so brain death is a state where there is hypoxic brain injury due to trauma or there is an intracranial bleed. And generally what we say is a patient is in coma and he's go, not going to wake up. So we declare them as brain dead and then retrieve their organs. It's not just the kidneys that are retrieved. You can uh, do a lung transplant. You can consider the patient for a cardiac transplant. You can take the intestines for an intestinal transplant and also the liver for a uh, liver transplant. Another organ that we simultaneously transplant with the kidneys is the pancreas. This is for recipients who got diabetes and kidney disease. We tend to take both the kidney and the pancreas. That's called as a simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant. And uh, that is um, uh, for people who have especially type 1 diabetes. So in the case of living donation, it can be a directed donation that is wherein a family member would come saying that I want to donate to a so and so family member because they've got a kidney problem, or else it can be a non directed donation. For example, it's called as altruistic donation that is a, a, a per person with goodwill, he just wants to donate kidney to any person who would benefit from it. 
and there's another thing called pair donation so pair donation is the process where kidneys are uh, kidney is transplanted from uh, sometimes the kidney may not be a good match in because the patient might recipient might have antibodies or the blood group may not be suitable for the family member so what we can do is paired kidney donation so there would be like uh, two pairs who are not matched where uh, the res the donor can match with the recipient two rather than the recipient one so we would uh, it's like uh, trading the organs uh, between different pairs so we so there are two aspects in terms of uh, transplanting patients that is one is we need to see if they are uh, blood group compatible okay only blood group compatibility is initially required we can also do people who are blood group incompatible that's called as the abo incompatible transplant uh, i'm not going to discuss about abo incompatible transplants uh, we'll just talk about the general a compatible transplants so when you see that the blood group is compatible the next step you see is whether they uh, they have they are H hla compatible and then they have uh, do they have antibodies and uh, are they a match in terms of that we do what is called cdc flow cross match that a cdc or a flow cross match and that's where the donors uh, uh, serum is uh, matched against the recipient's antigens and we see uh, sorry recipient's antibodies uh, serum is matched against the donor's uh, cells to see if they cause lysis and thereby see if they are compatible once they are compatible then we give them all patients who receive transplants would require immunosuppression because they are hla uh, no ex I, except for 10 twins everybody else is hla incompatible like they would not be or not all hlas will be matched so we need to give them immunosuppression because uh, i think you would have read this that is uh, whenever there is a new antigen that is if you place a kidney from a donor to a recipient the the do donor's hla would be different from the recipient so the donor would identify these things the um, the antigens present on the recipient and then that would uh, be identified by the antigen presenting cell and they would present it to the t helper cell the t helper cell can go on to produce cytotoxicity or they can stimulate the b cell and thereby produce uh, um, uh, either produce uh, antibodies or mature into plasma cells and uh, cause damage to the host so this is called as rejection so it can either be t cell dependent rejection or it can be antibody mediated rejection via the b cell pathway so by either mechanisms it can cause rejection and damage to the host so out of this there are two ways we give immunosuppression one is induction immunosuppression and the other one is uh, maintenance immunosuppression not going to go into the details but a few things that you need to know is that an induction is an agent which is given immediately before the transplant and uh, that's for, why we give induction is it gives us space for us to uh, reduce the maintenance uh, immunosuppression dose and also the other thing we need to know is uh, the induction immunosuppression primarily targets T cells. And as you all know, T helper cells are the first cells that kind of stimulate the B cells or the convert or produce cytotoxicity. So both cytotoxicity, T cell mediated and an antibody mediated rejection starts off with a T cell. So uh, it's important that we target T cells. And uh, following this, patients would usually be put on maintenance immunosuppression. I would come to the maintenance immunosuppression in the next few slides so previously historically if you see renal transplants started as early as 1950s and so on so what they would do is they would do a total body irradiation or fully myeloablate the bone marrow that is fully um, ablate the bone marrow the amount of uh, immunosuppressive medication that was used was very high but Nowadays, the principle is to use multiple medications at a lower dose so that the so we target different paths, okay, rather than at a single path. So this is kind of how the antigen presenting cell presents the antigen to the 
T cells. So the green cell over here is the antigen presenting cell. And there are multiple ways by which it can stimulate the T cell. So this is where we want to target by the immunosuppressive medications. So this is called as the three signal pathway. We have a signal one, signal two, and signal three, which uh, uh, by which the T cells can be activated. So we give agents to block these things. So uh, I'll not go into the detail, but uh, we will talk about briefly about the induction agents. So induction agents can be classified by two ways. That is, they can be classified as depleting or non-depleting. And depleting would be ATG and alemtuzumab, whereas non-depleting would be vesleximab and dasleximab. And polyclonal or monoclonal, you can classify it this way as well. And polyclonal will be ATG, whereas monoclonal will be vesleximab or alemtuzumab. So I think you all would know about this. That is how the nomenclature of antibodies come. It is important to know that uh, the substem B kind of tells you which type of uh, uh, where the antibodies are derived. If it starts with uh, uh, MO, it means it's mouse. XI means uh, it's chimeric antibodies that you is humanized, whereas uh, uh, UMAP, that is example, would be rituximab and stuff would be example rituximab would be chimeric antibody and so on so what induction agent should i use so there are different induction agents like atg alemtuzumab bezaleximab and uh, there can be no induction as well i'm not going to go into the detail but just an important thing to know would be in terms of potency wise atg would have the highest potency followed by alemtuzumab bezaleximab and no induction Okay. And in terms of ATG, there are different types of ATG that are available. One is the horse ATG, rabbit ATG, or the Fresenius ATG. The most commonly used ATG would be a rabbit ATG. Uh, in terms of uh, side effects, it's also important to know ATG causes low counts and we need to follow up the counts. And also it causes something called as a cytokine release syndrome, which can present with hypotension on something similar to anaphylaxis after administering. So ATG will always be given with uh, pre-medications and uh, needs to be followed up. So coming on to maintenance immunosuppression, this is important because we, you, we might see, though we may not be in the renal specialty, we might see these patients uh, with kidney transplant in other specialties as well. It's important to know that most people would have three drugs, that is one is steroids, they would have something called as an anti-metabolite, which can be azathioprine or mycophenolate. The most commonly used drug would be mycophenolate. And the next thing would be a calcineurin inhibitor. And calcineurin inhibitor, an example would be a tacrolimus or cyclosporin, and tacrolimus would be used. In rare instances, we might use other drugs like mTOR inhibitors. Um, examples would be everolimus or serolimus as well. So uh, for want of time, I'm just going to be brief. So what are the risks we all and discussed that uh, the kidney transplant provides a lot of benefit especially in terms of uh, uh, increasing the lifespan of the patient increasing the quality of life of the patient uh, what are the risks are obviously it's a surgery and it would carry it so any surgery would carry its own risk it, in terms of uh, um, DVTs, pulmonary embolism, or surgical complications itself. So that's one thing to be considered. And one thing that just to be taken home is kidney transplant patient being on immunosuppressions are at high risk for infections. They can have so infections that are common in the general population, like bacterial infections or tuberculosis or things like that. Or they can have specific inf infection, viral infections like CMV and BKV infections as well. And these are to be tested in patients with uh, kidney transplant. For example, a patient with diarrhea following transplant may just be a community acquired pneumonia, uh, sorry, community acquired diarrhea, or it can be drug induced in the kidney transplant patient, or it could be due to see a cytomegalovirus infection. So the management of a Post kidney transplant patient is quite challenging. It's also quite interesting as well because you've got a lot of uh, um, things to look at. And 
The other thing that needs to be considered is kidney transplant in the long run kind of increases risk for malignancies as well. Solid organ malignancies are only mildly increased. There are specific cancers which can occur following transplant. That's one thing is called as the post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder or the PTLD. So PTLD is lymphoma occurring following transplant. And the difference compared to the general population would be here, uh, kidney transplant patients are at high risk for EBV and EBV kind of increases the risk of malignancy in these patients. And another spe specific malignancy that happens following kidney transplant is Kaposi's sarcoma. That's uh, again, uh, virus driven infection. So that would be by HHV or human herpes virus. And uh, that's more common in people with African ethnicity rather than in our population. We do rarely see Kaposi sarcoma in our population. And uh, in want of time, I'm going to just uh, last two slides of my presentation. So taking care of kidney transplant patient, I think if you are to take home, uh, this is one of the important things you need to whenever you are caring for a patient for following a transplant you should always ensure that people are adequately hydrated unlike the native kidney the mechanisms and the tubules are not as mature enough in the transplant kidney in simple terms so there is tubular dysfunction and they tend to pass a lot of urine especially in the immediate transplant they may pass around 5 to 10 liters or something like that. So you need to ensure that hydration is uh, adequate. And then we should always avoid skipping immunosuppression unless we, unless you get an uh, advice from the treating renal physician over there. And the next thing that needs to be done is whenever a patient with kidney transplant on steroids, uh, presence to you with uh, infection or vomiting, anything that would reduce the appetite, you should double the dose of steroids, especially, for example, most patients in the long-term kidney transplant would be on five milligram of steroids. And you need to, this is like a minimum dose. Uh, this is because, you know, in the ad adrenals are suppressed in people who are taking steroids. And uh, normally in terms of stress, uh, our ad adrenals are able to produce more steroids to cope up and keep up the blood pressure. Whereas in terms of stress on a patient who is already on prednisolone, our adrenals are suppressed. So they wouldn't be able to produce the extra steroids. So we need to supplement them. And this is something that's very important. So as discussed earlier, um, we have a huge shortage of organs and uh, this organ shortage is one thing that could uh, that's hampering the more more mortality of patients with uh, ckd and i think uh, as discussed previously this is called a xenotransplant so wherein kidney from pig models uh, or other animals are uh, there has been a successful transplant from the pig more from a pig to human as well. So this would come up in the future as well. So just summarizing to take home, I would say um, if somebody asks you if I am fit like for donation, I think we should strongly encourage kidney donation because it's a safe procedure from preview compared to decades back. And uh, the next thing I would say would be also promote kidney transplantation because it improves the quality of life and also the mortality of patients with uh, kidney disease. And uh, in the event that you are uh, taking care of a kidney transplant patient, always look at hydration and also may ensure that immunosuppression suppressants are appropriately given and also uh, and also see to that this if the steroids need increased dosage, please do that. Uh, I think uh, I would stop with this. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer either over chat or uh, I'm happy to talk, uh, answer by email as well. I think in the chat box, Aditya has asked, uh, please explain ATG. Okay, so ATG is called as anti-thymocyte globulin. So anti-thymocyte globulin is, uh, is a medication where 
you let me just bring up that slide yeah so the the thymus cells are injected into the rabbit at, uh, which in the hope that the thymus contains a lot of t cells so from the rabbit would mount an immune response to the, the thymus T cells that we infuse into the rabbit and produce an immune response against the T cells. And what we do is we take the sera of the rabbit and purify them and take out only the antibodies. And these antibodies are called as the anti-thymocyte globulin. Okay. So this, when you inject into the patient, it will destroy the T cells. And as we discussed earlier, T cells are very important in um, the immune response to, to a new antigen. So when we are placing a new kidney, it's going to stimulate an antigen response and uh, stimulate the T cells via the APCs. So if we give ATG, that's going to destroy these T cells. So in the hope that uh, we don't have much T cells to mount an immune response and thereby we prevent rejection. And... Uh, a lot of uh, studies have been shown, uh, done, and especially in high-risk patients, giving ATG would uh, reduce the um, rates of rejection and one-year graft survivals are better. I hope I answered your question, Aditya. Is that okay or do you need any further questions? Or... Okay, if there are no further questions, I've given my email address again. I'll just display it for a short, brief thing. I, if you want, you can email me any questions or any career advice or anything. So that's fine. And uh, I would hand it back to the organizers. And thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, thank you so much, sir. The session was indeed very insightful and interesting. There's one question from Seherin Hussain. For job in abroad, it is good to do MSc in dialysis or only BSc? You could answer this question. Uh, sorry, M MSc? In dialysis or only BSc? Okay, so uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, over here, the dialysis course is not recognized in the UK. And uh, the nursing teams are the ones who take care of uh, dialysis patients. There is no specific dialysis course. And uh, it's more like engineering people or uh, uh, they take care of the dialysis machines, whereas care to the, the technical aspects is taken care by them. And care for dialysis patients is provided by, um, by nurses rather than dialysis technicians. So um, I don't think our course is particularly uh, useful in the UK. But then uh, I think in the Middle East, it's quite uh, helpful. Uh, I'm happy to follow this up and uh, give you more detailed advice if you could email me. Okay, thank Any you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, we have questions. This one other question. Does a kidney transplant patient can marry? Yeah, they can uh, marry. They can lead a normal life. Uh, only thing they need to discuss with the transplant uh, physician about uh, the medications they can take because... Uh, um, certain drugs can interfere with uh, fertility, both for the male and uh, in the female, it can again affect uh, the fetus. So you need to plan pregnancy and uh, let them know. And that's one of the major benefits of transplant as well. In If you are on dialysis, the fertility rates are very, very low. It's very rare for a dialysis patient to successfully conceive and more so to have a successful delivery, to be frank, it is possible. It's not impossible. There are dialysis patients who do that, but then the number of patients who get this done is very low. Whereas if you consider a transplant patient, they would be able to do it uh, much more easily. Yep. Uh, sir, we have another question. Uh, Dr. Sharma, which course after bachelor's of pharmacy? 
uh, I'm not sure about the pharmacy pathway to come in over here, but then again, if you could email me, I can uh, uh, um, find that as well. And one thing I would say is pharmacists are quite valued over here. Uh, next question, which country is good for dialysis student for better income? I think that would be, if you're just looking at from a pers um, from a financial perspective, I think Middle East would be a better option, I would say, because they would recognize degrees done in India, and uh, that's an easier path as well. Uh, next question, what about masters in dialysis? How much useful it will be? Uh, uh, as I told before, in terms of uh, dialysis, uh, the there is uh, the dialysis course in India is not recognized in the UK. That's uh, um, I don't think uh, in terms of uh, dialysis technicians, it's so easy to come over here. You will have to go via the nursing pathway. Uh, that would be to do the exams for nursing and stuff, and then come over here. Okay, I think we have, uh, okay, one more, one more question. What about future of dialysis in India? Uh, I think we provide a good dialysis service in India. Uh, and uh, I worked over here and over there as well. I think uh, we do really a good job. Uh, um, I think we definitely have a future for dialysis, especially with the um, uh, aging population and dial uh, and people with uh, uh, diabetes increasing day by day uh, the number of kidney patients are definitely going to be higher and uh, uh, at present living donation looks to be the uh, only feasible option for people in india unfortunately the disease donor program is not i know it's a bit active but then not as active as to reduce the number of patients on dialysis so um, i don't see transplants uh, just taking away patients on dialysis so there's going to be definitely need for dialysis and uh, yeah that's my opinion yeah then we have another question from Aditya. How to get MBBS in UK? I think uh, the undergraduate medical ed education over here is quite expensive. And uh, we might need to um, do their uh, um, A-level exams and then join uh, um, the MBBS program over here which is quite expensive. People pay the loan for their uh, MBBS exams uh, until they become a consultant and stuff, which is almost like 10 years following they complete their studies. So that's quite expensive. But if you complete MBBS, then uh, the pathway to come in over here is to do a PLAB exam and then come over here. Whereas if you're a postgraduate, like if you're a, a, a MD, uh, you have come done your MD and stuff, you can do the MRCP exam and then you can get your GMC registration and come in over here. Okay, I think that's all for questionnaire. But for okay. questions, you may contact uh, the speakers on their respective email IDs. We have almost reached the end of the webinar. I have few announcements to make. Just a moment. Okay, sorry for interruption. We have almost reached at the end of the webinar. I have a few announcements to make. The details about the certificates and the feedback link for the webinar will be shared via email. I hope everyone found today's, interest, today's session very informative and uh, useful. Once again, I would like to thank our speakers and each one of you for active participation and involvement. Thank you all once again. Have a nice day.
Uh, feedback link will be sent by email. For more questions, you may contact the speakers via email. The feedback link and the certificates will be sent to you on your email by tomorrow. And we are winding up the conference. You may leave now. Thank you so much and have a nice day.